Hi everyone, this is Dr. Dalia Ghanem, research, um, uh, researcher at the Carnegie Middle East Center in Beirut. We are happy to uh, meet you today virtually. I have with me uh, two guests and friends and I am happy to have them today to discuss my latest paper, Algeria lands a country into themselves. So we have Dr. Isabel Werenfels. Uh, Dr. Isabel Werenfels is a, um, a senior fellow at the research division of Middle East and Africa at the SWP. And we have with us a Dr. Dr. Miguel is a political scientist specializing in the politics of informal and illegal economies at the Institute of Development Studies. Uh, so this is going to be a chat between us. We are hoping to discuss, as I said, my latest paper on the Algerian and Tunisian border, and also, of course, uh, to get a bit broader on the discussion on Algeria. And of course, uh, hopefully we will have enough time to answer your questions. Uh, so uh, just to give you a bit of uh, background and you know uh, about my uh, uh, paper, uh, this is a field work that I conducted in Algeria between March and April 2019 and uh, I wanted to understand questions of smuggling but I wanted to go beyond the cliche and the assumption according to which you know smugglers are the bad guys and they are bad for the economy of a country and the state is the good actor trying to regulate this uh, this informal economy so i wanted to know their motivation i wanted to know why do they do that why do they engage in these activities what are the tactics that they use and the strategies how do they um, manage to smuggle goods and what kind of goods uh, they smuggle into and from algeria uh, of course uh, uh, the paper um, talks and discuss all these point, points, but I am going just in a few minutes uh, to uh, to uh, focus on my main argument. Uh, so the first point that is important to tackle and that I discussed in this paper is state neglect. Uh, it is very important to note that state neglect and shortage of jobs have kept Algeria northeastern border the lands poor and underdeveloped. As a matter of fact, while we are talking today, this is particularly relevant. Uh, if we see what happened in the south of Algeria a few days ago. Uh, so uh, basically, this is a situation that is common in all the towns and the small towns that are uh, uh, next to the borders of Algeria. So as a result, smuggling has taken root and is for many families a career that is actually performed uh, from uh, father to uh, son. The second uh, finding is that was about the smuggling networks uh, and the way in which the resident of the borders and the towns, you know, uh, circumvent uh, the state security measures. But here again, it was very important to see that uh, nothing is totally black or white, and it was important not to have, you know, a Manichaean view. Uh, so uh, I, uh, of course, there is a connivance between state officials and uh, smugglers, and there is almost to dance, if I may say, very well choreographed between these two actors in uh, the, 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 the smuggling activities. As many smugglers told me, uh, there is they buy the road, they say they buy the road every day, every night uh, to uh, smuggle goods from Algeria into Tunisia and vice versa. And they do it, of course, with the connivance of state official. Why this laissez aller policy? Uh, uh, from the 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 the, the uh, state official well uh, it has smuggling has long been tolerated by law enforcement official uh, cross border smuggling have over time created the parallel economy and they do it because both the state and the smugglers have an interest in doing so uh, what is very important to note uh, is that for uh, um, for borderland communities smuggling is the occupation 
par excellence, uh, meaning, uh, of course, the king product remains gasoline, but uh, smuggling of this product uh, accounts for more than 70% of uh, the, 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 the jobs uh, in uh, the region. So why does also the, the, the state let uh, people and um, population of the borderlands uh, smuggle? Uh, of course, uh, there is a rationality of alternative, uh, to quote uh, Migdal. Uh, so behind state official for letting smuggling at the borders. So smuggling functions as a safety valve, as I said it, that relieves some of the economic pressure felt by the inhabitants of Algeria's neg neglected eastern provinces, but also the smuggler enhance the security services effort to keep the triple threat of drugs, weapon, and jihadists at bay. It is true that there is a nexus, and we heard a lot about this nexus between jihadists and contraband. And I am not saying that it doesn't exact, uh, exist. Of course it does. But in this particular region, with these particular people that I met, it wasn't the majority of people. Um, so again, we have a Lissi Ali that is, you know, a rationality of alternatives simply because uh, the Algerian government cannot, you know, provide uh, these population, these borderland population with the basic goods. And they do, uh, they are cognizant about the fact that uh, these uh, local actors actually provide better than the state. Uh, and of course, um, when I when I wrote the, the, the paper, I, I put one or two policy uh, relevance recommendation, uh, policy recommendation, and I said any government crackdown on smuggling networks would shut off the safety valve that is critical to relieving the economic pressure bearing down on countless families in the borderland. And actually what happened recently in the south of Algeria um, in uh, the little town of uh, Tin Zauti, uh, shows exactly that. Uh, the security forces installed the fence that cut actually the road to the wadi and uh, cutting the population from its source of water, but also from going uh, to the other side in Mali. And this created clashes between the security forces and the local, uh, the local um, population. So again, uh, this is not a paper in which I judge uh, the smuggler or this uh, the, the informal economy. Rather than that, I try to think about it as, um, you know, what uh, what kind of alternative can we offer these local borderland communities in order to uh, keep them away from smuggling? What can the state do? And again, uh, the kind of policies that are drafted in Algiers by policy makers who just want to securize the uh, frontier without taking any uh, into consideration the specificities of the borderland is very dangerous for Algeria and for Tunisia. Uh, so, um, the, the, the paper conclude on this note. Uh, of course, it is, um, you know, as I said, if this securitization, secure sorry, I have hard time with this word, but if, if these security measures are not accompanied by successful effort to rejuvenate uh, the borderlands, then uh, cracking down on the population is the only solution that the state has to offer. And this is going to create more violence and probably we will have to witness some serious uh, issues with violent radicalization. So um, I hope I haven't been too long. Uh, now I open the floor to either Isabel or Max or both of you. So please. I, I suggest Max Robertson, um, as the person who works on informal economies primarily and work more on political systems. Okay, so let's start out then. Okay, I mean, um, first of all, I want to say thank you very much, um, Dahlia and, and Carnegie, for, for inviting me to this. Um, I apologize in advance if I'm occasionally difficult to hear. The people in the house next to me have picked five minutes ago as the perfect moment to start building works. Um, so I hope that doesn't disrupt us, disrupt us too much. Um, 
But yeah, thank you very much, um, Dahlia. It's always really nice to see the argument repeated that um, there's a close connection between smuggling and economic livelihoods and borderlands, and that we need to understand these livelihoods and their economic dimension to understand the effects of the securitization that these borderlands are going through. Um, we had agreed beforehand that this is going to be more of a chat, uh, so I'll try to limit my remarks um, and make them as quick as possible. I'll also kind of focus more on the borderlands and smuggling aspects, um, as I think both of you are, are much more qualified to talk about the Algerian politics angle of, um, of it than I am, so I'll kind of uh, keep myself a bit limited there. Um, and I'll try to make four kind of brief observations, um, some of which are, are more a question than a comment. Um, and the first is, is on similarities and differences. And I was quite struck reading the paper, um, on the one hand, how many similarities there are to other borderlands in the region. Um, I mean, the, the kind of very structured interaction between security forces and smugglers that you're describing is something I've seen not just on Tunisia's borders with Algeria, but Tunisia's border with Libya, Morocco's border with Algeria. It's a very common factor in the region. Um, also, the fact that this is framed locally as you know, the only economic alternative, the only option in a context of historical, economic, and political marginalization, I think is a very common feature in the region. It was, it was kind of interesting to see how, um, how broadly applicable these patterns are throughout the region. Um, however, there's also an interesting difference here, which is that if you look at almost all borderlands in North Africa right now, they're currently under enormous pressure. Um, we see smuggling being pushed back, being increasingly cracked down on, being securitized, and through that becoming increasingly um, uh, it, it, its structure becoming um, increasingly um, heterogeneous. And the borderland you're looking at seems to be a, a bit of an exception there, at least for now. And I thought that was that's an interesting observation, but I think it also then begs the question um, how long it's going to stay that way. And I think this, this is the second point, and this is one about kind of static and dynamic factors. So the, if, if you read your paper, it, it, it reads somewhat static. It, it, it describes a relationship at a point in time. But I think it's also important to, to highlight that there's been enormous change at the Tunisian-Algerian border over the last decade or so. Um, we've seen, of course, the 2011 revolution in Tunisia, which has uh, removed the Ben Ali regime, but also through that removed many of its intermediaries that were operating on that border. And it has led to a, a restructuring of smuggling networks at that border, which I think mistakenly, but quite commonly has been described as, as a democratization of smuggling on that border. Um, we have seen the increasing securitization of that border as a resp uh, response to increasing um, jihadi activity in, uh, in parts of those borderlands. Um, we have seen, I think, uh, partly as a response to the um, changing patterns of drug smuggling in the region, uh, but also partly as a response to um, some of the conflicts in the region, the increasing role of some of the illicit goods, um, so both drugs and, and arms in the region. And um, I think more recently, uh, changes in the oil price have also somewhat changed the political calculus on that, uh, on that border. Um, so I'd be very curious to learn a bit more about A, how these changes have affected these borderlands, but also where we think these borderlands are going next. Um, and I think that, that goes to a third point, which is um, who can affect change and who's driving change in this borderland? And I think that points a little bit to this, this notion of the partnership um, between uh, smugglers and security forces that you're describing. And you, you mentioned earlier, um, it, it's almost a bit like a dance, like a choreographed dance. So if, if the relationship between security forces and smugglers is a choreographed dance, um, I'm German, so I have to be careful when I talk about dancing, but I guess my question is, is who leads, right? Who is, who is in charge of that relationship? Is it an equal partnership? And I mean, as you, as you highlight, um, quite well, there is an economic dimension to that. And there's a historical economic neglect of these regions. So there's very little alternatives for people in those regions. Um, so even if we do see security forces tolerating these kinds of activities, I would ask the question if they're not still in the larger scheme of it in charge of what is happening on those borders. Um, and to what degree the lack of activities for local populations still leave them incredibly vulnerable in this partnership if there is a crackdown. And crackdowns do happen. I mean, the Moroccan-Algerian border is, is a good example of that. And even if we talk about a, a, you know, a structural dance, a choreographed dance, violence exists at these borders and crackdowns exist. And we see young men getting arrested and thrown in, in, in jail. Um, so there's, there, there are cracks in that stability. And I think these cracks point to a power imbalance. So I think it'd be, I think it'd be interesting to think about that a little bit more. 
Um, I mean, there, there was a survey on, on the Tunisian side of the border, so both on the Tunisian-Libyan and the Tunisian-Algerian border a little while ago, that asked smugglers, um, would you like to do something else? Would you rather have a formal job? And quite a lot of them said, yes, I would, um, but I can't because there is no alternative to this. So I think that sheds a little bit of light on the unequal relationship that's at play there. Um, and a final point, and then I'll, I'll kind of wrap it up um, for now, is, I mean, the title of this paper points to the, the borderlands as, as a country upon itself. Um, and you are, you are arguing that here is, there's an unusual pattern of state building at play here, that uh, an uneven pattern or, or a specific borderland pattern due to the kind of importance of illegal rents in pacifying and including these borderlands populations. And I am asking myself how unusual this really is. Um, I mean, as I, as I said in the beginning, this is a pattern we're seeing across the borderlands of North Africa. This is, if we're honest, a pattern that we're seeing across borderlands of the developing world um, that we're seeing historically in Europe. And that I think even if we go away from borderlands, we still see as a, as a central feature of state building in the developing world more widely, right? So the, the role of illegal rents, of informal economies, of, of side payments, um, of, of um, informal uh, rents in kind of these Mushta Khan's political settlement is incredibly common. So, so I guess maybe as a, as a provocative question is here, is this a country upon itself or is this just you know, a feature of the country? Um, but I think in that point, I'm already slowly uh, getting towards the Algerian politics territory and will happily hand over to Isabel, who um, is much better placed to speak about that than I am. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, uh, Max, you already laid out some of the threads that I was going to follow, and Dalia, many of them. So let me just begin by saying I, I was fascinated, Dalia, that you picked the border least in the limelight of all the border. And I think also the one with the least symbolic political baggage of all the borders. I mean, if you look at Algeria, Morocco, we all know it, it's in the limelight, in the spotlight, and it is also the border of the propaganda wars. A few years ago, we had migrants being shuffled back and forth, despite the securitization of the border that Max just described. So it's always a question, I think borders are at times also very porous if there is a political will um, on, on the two sides. Um, and if we look at the Libya-Mali border, of course, um, security is the real issue. But also, um, I think with Mali, there is another sensitivity or sensibility for Algeria, which is the G5 and international involvement in Mali. So I would say that different borders carry different political, local, and historic sensitivities. And I would like to say a few words on the South, because as you just said, Dalia, of course, if we look at Tim Zawatin, I've never been there. Um, um, so, you know, I'd be hesitant to judge, but of course, I imagine we have the same socioeconomic grievances, if not worse, that you just described. But I think we have a certain intersectionality because that it overlaps with a sense of racial discrimination in the South. So it's also a different setting. I mean, when, when young people or older people put up signs to our red lights matter, then I think we have another issue coming in that we may not have at the Tunisian-Algerian borders. So I, you know, the South with its nuclear tests, fracking, all these things carries a different baggage. And I think there, you know, would be a, a totally different ballgame again to discuss that. And I think just my last comment or second last on, on the South, I think it's, it's quite paradoxical how in the imaginaire, I think of the Algerians, there are not just the visible borders, the borders we have um, that you just all described, but I think we have invisible borders that play a big role and the border between the North and the South, the belongings, I think that's quite an important one between a Saharan identity and the Northern Mediterranean. And I always see that and I, I find it interesting to, to see the relationship to the South, which I find with everyone who's ever been there and particularly with my Algerian friends in the North is very, um, is very positive towards the South, at the same time a bit paternalistic and with very little, I think, understanding for the Africanity of the South, for the Saharan Sahel identity. So let me, let me keep it at that. If, I, if we now go to your border, um, I, I was wondering, as Max did, a little bit about the changes, how this was affected. And I mean, this is a border that in, I would imagine until 62, the Jarif, the whole region was one region socially, economically, 
And then with, with state formation, identities came out, then security issues came out in the 90s from the Algerian side. So later increasing securitization as Max described. So I find it interesting to know how, how local people, smugglers, but also regular individuals that are used to crossing borders adapt to that. Um, now, having I wouldn't want to say more on borders as it's not my research focus, but I'd like to go to one of your arguments, which, which says, I think, more about the Algerian system, or which is a question. You said the regime is not clamping down, or it shouldn't clamp down because it's a safety valve for socioeconomic grievances, and um, it shouldn't push the smugglers into the arms of the jihadis. I think it's very valid, um, very important arguments. But my question is, isn't one a major reason for not clamping down on the smugglers the fear of upsetting the delicate balance of clientelist networks that go all the way to the center. I mean, you describe um, smuggling with tacit approval of local authorities, but what about elites within or close to the regime? I'm thinking now of a case which was you know, all over, which was the cocaine and bushy case, which was on none of the borders we discussed now, but I mean, it's hard to imagine that there aren't figures and networks outside the border region that um, profit from large-scale smuggling. So maybe you would want to explain that a little bit um, as um, I have worked on that. And then I, I would like to follow up on Max's question. How exceptional is what we see in the borderlands? Isn't the nature of the Algerian system its very informality? Um, and isn't what we see in the bo borderlands maybe the most visible and possibly not even the most radical expression of the weakness of the formal state in Algeria? I mean, so much in Algeria, from what I have encountered, is informal. And trabendo is everywhere. So, you know, the question is, is in what way does it differ from what we see in the O Plateau or someone else, which we would call Trabendo, and which is also, you know, cigarette smuggling, all these things, um, extended networks. And um, then a question regarding, and I'll, I'll leave it at that then, um, the impact of COVID possibly. I mean, we have seen that COVID has, there has been quite little confidence, I think, in Algeria in the state's infrastructure, medical infrastructure and other, the critical infrastructures. So the civil society has been organizing itself. Things are being done informally. Um, jobs will be lost. I mean, to what extent will COVID, in your view, kind of accelerate this informality and the weaknesses of the state institution and not only expose them, but kind of, uh, yeah, make all of these dynamics of, of informalization get stronger rather than weaker. I'll leave it at that. That was a lot. So Thank you. Thank you both for all these remarks, questions, and for challenging the, the, the paper and the argument. Um, well, I would start with one question that both of you uh, asked, which is why this is exceptional. Is it really exceptional what's going on in the border? I think uh, I would say, no, there is nothing exceptional. When writing the paper with my editor, for instance, we had you know a lot of back and forth. And when he chose the, 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 the title, you know, we discussed it. But for instance, uh, one of the things that I said at the beginning, I said, my paper, like many before me and uh, more competent people uh, did it, I am thinking here about all the work of Migdal uh, that he did on um, on uh, borders is to challenge you know this notion according to which the state is supposed to be omnipotent and omnipresent you know everywhere even at the borders and the state is supposed to be super centralized so even with a semi-authoritarian regime like algeria getting you know all your borders super tightly uh, closed is very difficult giving uh, giving the, the the superficies of the country but also because 
because as Migdal said it in his uh, different uh, uh, works, he said that this notion, this very Weberian notion, according to which uh, the state is omnipresent and omnipotent, is actually an, ide an ideal type, uh, an ideal type. It is not, the state is not supposed to be like that. So this is what I was trying to show, that actually even a state like Algeria cannot, which is semi-authoritarian, cannot get hold of all its borders. The second thing that I wanted to show is also how this country that is immense, that is a huge, uh, cannot have development plans that can actually please, uh, if I may say, everyone. Uh, since, you know, the, 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 um, since the, the, the independence of the country in 1962, the state engaged in development, uh, you know, of, of uh, different regions in order, you know, to uh, have a better, uh, to, 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 to avoid uh, social and uh, uh, regional disparities, but unfortunately, uh, reality is that the further you go from Algiers, and the further or uh, the more um, uh, obvious are these inequalities. You know, I did the, the, the travel from Algiers, the capital, to Mdawrush, Lwanzat, Bissa, Bir Latr, in a car. And it was very interesting to see that the more we advance in the interior of the country, the less there was restaurant, the less, you know, the road was asphalted, uh, there was uh, less hospitals, less school, and so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, these also borderland uh, uh, located in the high plateau, uh, such as Atarf, such as Elwanza, such as Bessa, witnessed also in the 80s uh, significant population growth growth. Uh, and as such, you know, these small villages became towns, but unfortunately, this didn't uh, involve more development. When development uh, there is, uh, as I showed it in the paper, uh, you know, uh, the investment are localized in the bigger city, uh, bigger cities. For instance, the district of Tebesa is home to one of the largest phosphate reserve and is also the district that actually takes the biggest shares of uh, investment in the region. Um, out of 5,571 uh, investments, small and medium-sized enterprises in the province uh, that actually employed more than 17,000 uh, people, most of them were actually in Tebesa. So you just go out of Tebesa and you have uh, literally no man's uh, land. Uh, it also, also, uh, you know, related to the economic activity. Uh, as you may know, um, Algeria invested, the state invested in the northern uh, coast. Uh, so everything, all the economic activity is uh, focused in the north. Actually, more than 46% of the economic activity is in the north. So as Max said it, what kind of livelihood, what kind of economic activity does it leave uh, to others? Um, you said earlier, uh, you talked about this poll in which you have a smuggler saying that they would quit. Well, uh, I had also such answers in uh, in uh, in both Qasrin and uh, in uh, in Tbissa and the Luanza. And actually, one of the smuggler really who was very sweet guy who had you know uh, a master in economics uh, told me uh, in a very you know moving um, uh, uh, voice. He said, "Look at me." He said, "I smell uh, gasoline the entire day." Do you think that there is a human being who would love to smell and to look like me the entire day? Of course, I am not doing that by choice. I would like to work. I, if they, uh, he said it in Arabic, he said, Ida uh, irigluni, which means if they fix me, meaning if they find a job, they uh, exactly, then I will quit. And many of them told me uh, the same thing. Uh, but again, what is in the region? For instance, a, a region like Elwenza, which has, you know, the biggest Manjam uh, al um, uh, which is, uh, you know, for uh, uh, for Axelor uh, Mital uh, Anaba. Uh, 
is located in Al Wamza and doesn't hire. And when they hire people, they pay them very, very small amount of money and there is no job security. So of course, you know, there is this problem of development, of jobs, of, of uh, uh, you know, sense of otherness as well. And I think maybe this is more, you know, as you said, Isabel, uh, more maybe salient in the case of the South because, you know, there is this question of Africanity. And as you said it, they, 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 they use the hashtag Black Lives Matters. But even in the northeastern borderland, there is this feeling of otherness, uh, be it on the Algerian side or on the Tunisian uh, uh, side. On the Algerian side, people would tell you, you, you know, meaning uh, you people from the capital, because, you know, from my, uh, my dialect, they can say that I am not from the region. And they would tell you, you, you don't care about us. Actually, you still see us as this very backward region that is, uh, that is uh, totally backward, but also you judge us. And it is true because when I talk to people in Algiers and I said I'm going to do fieldwork uh, about the smugglers, the, 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 the looks and the opinions were very harsh toward them. Um, so um, about the choreographed dance, uh, yes, my you're right uh, it is not totally balanced but I you know it's a dynamic uh, so sometimes for instance after the fall of uh, Ben Ali as you said it things changed uh, for instance after the attack of the gas facility of Aina Minas in 2013 there was serious crackdown on smuggler in the region and the population was very upset so it is a story and the dance between the two of collusion, coercion, violence, adaptation, and each time, each period uh, brings its own uh, dynamics. But when I was there, it seemed that everybody, everybody was happy with the, you know, with the deal and with what's going on. But when I talked also to the security um, people, state representative, Two things uh, were very important in their, uh, in their uh, interviews. The first thing, many of them told me, we are people from this region. So asking us to crack down on their, our own people is very difficult. Plus everybody, you know, there is a system of interconnectedness that is very strong in this region because everybody basically knows everybody. And even on the other side, all Algerians to whom I spoke said, oh, I have a cousin in Tunisia, I have an aunt, I have many uh, members of my family. So the system of, uh, of relationships and is very strong. Uh, so when you ask gendarmes or security forces from the region to crack down on people, that is very complicated. Then of course, the Algerian state, you know, the Algerian authorities uh, tried sometimes to bring people from other region in order to crack on the population. But then even when they done that, they realized that uh, when there was clashes between smugglers and the Algerian security forces, which happened, by the way, with real bullets, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, there was systematically clashes against the security forces the day after. When smugglers have been jailed, there was uh, clashes. So there is this, uh, this is why I said there is a rationality of alternative, because the state do know, does know from a fact that it is not able to deliver. So it leaves this part of uh, the, 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 the country to other, um, to other uh, actors. Um, now, uh, you know, about how the COVID-19 and, you know, everything is going to change the dynamics. To be honest, at this point, I can't tell you. It would be good, you know, to go and to do field work and to see also, as Max said, you know, the price uh, of the barrel, uh, you know, uh, is falling. So this will have also an impact on, uh, on, uh, on the prices in Algeria and hence on the smuggler activity. But one thing is sure, there will be uh, changes 
within the next month in the region in particular and in Algeria in general. Um, the COVID-19, uh, if anything, it shows what many Algerians were aware of, and I don't think they needed the proof, but it shows the incapacity and uh, inability of the Algerian authorities to deliver goods again and to deliver uh, something that they've been proud of, the health system in Algeria. From the first days of the COVID-19, actually the, 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 the health sector was totally overwhelmed. We do remember, for instance, those nurses who went on, uh, you know, symbolic protests saying that they didn't have the means to uh, face a, a pandemic. And uh, today, the policies of the Algerian authorities showed that actually they are totally overwhelmed. How many times we heard the boon saying that the confinement is going to be over and then coming back and two days later saying, oh, we are going to confine people again. So there is, you know, uh, these uh, this uh, quack, if I may say in French, and uh, I believe that the post-COVID-19 is going to be uh, the, 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 the beginning of a new uh, wave of protest in Algeria, be it in the uh, borderland, as we've seen a few days ago in Tinzautan, or in Algiers. Um, you know, uh, there is serious questions about whether the Hirak is going to go back in the street or no, when it is going to do it, and for now the authorities are holding on, uh, trying, you know, to avoid um, having it back in the street. But one thing remains sure, I think 2020 is going to be a difficult here for Algeria, and I think uh, this is in general going to be a difficult decade uh, for Algeria, but not only for Morocco, for Tunisia, for Lebanon, where I am living, for many uh, countries in the Arab uh, region. I don't know if I answered all your question. I I, I did a mix of everything. I just want to uh, uh, say one thing. I, uh, you know, the question you raised initially, um, all these development plans and the regions haven't been developed. I think there's a pattern we see in Tunisia as well and in, in Morocco. And I think one important, I, th I think there are, there's many aspects to it, but one is where do the elites come from? Um, do they come from the coastal regions? Do they, I mean, Clemson looks very nice um, and had a development boost in the past two decades. And I would argue, that had something to do with the fact that the president, the former Bouteflika, came yeah. from the West and invested yeah. a lot of money. And yeah. that was the Sahel. And I think it's always very instructive to look at these, when there are free elections or halfway, electoral maps, as in Tunisia, where you could see so clearly, I think the election of uh, Marzouki and the Sepsi was the clearest, how yeah. there was such a division going through the country, which had a lot to do where funds have flowed to in the past. So I think this, this, this is a pattern that we could possibly even argue is in Germany there, that certain regions um, in, in, in the eastern part of Germany, despite lots of money transfer, have not developed the way others have. So, but I do think in democracies, of course, it's a question of accountability and then political parties will be punished, etc. And this is not the case in Algeria. So yeah. we can afford so far, they can afford to do it. And as long as they can afford to, they will go on. And this brings me to the next question. And this is what you just raised. How long will um, the Algerian system be able to function given that there is a cascade of crisis now? I mean, in the past, there was the legitimacy crisis. Um, there was... Uh, not really a serious economic crisis. I mean, there was always the periphery suffering, but now we have um, we have a, a number of crises coming together. We have the health crisis, we have the economic crisis, which I do think um, will make it very difficult to uphold a system um, which has worked, uh, to put it uh, very simply, in a distributive manner. So. Now, I think the interesting question with regard to your issue, the Hirak will come back or not, is what kind of Hirak will come back? 
Yeah. Will it be the Hirat? Do we, can we still even speak of one Hirat? Um, how will different regions react? I mean, what will it mean, for instance, that at the moment, if I see it rightly, protests are beginning in one region, in Kabylie, very strongly, and in the South, and that in that region, you also have a large number of cases of COVID. Um, you know, how, what will this mean also for the centrifugal powers within the state? Um, with the Herak, I had a sense for a while that there was um, reconciliation with the different identities, with the diversity, things were coming together. Now I have a sense that centrifugal powers are setting in again. And if yeah. you look at the recipes and the strategies of the state to counter it, we see a new finance law, we see announcements, but we see the constitutional process. None of it, I think, which is convincing to the citizens and in, in, in such a cascade of crisis will really have chances of bringing remedies quickly. But this is a very uh, superficial tour of the horizon, but I do think that the question you just put, um, you know, what will 20, not so much maybe 2020, but 2021, when the yeah. liquidity crisis will set on. And my last point, the question will be, will the Algerian government for ideological reasons not go to the IMF and do the trade-off with, with, with an economic major crisis? Or will they go to the IMF or other sources that may be less problematic, but also external debt, and um, um, in order to try to avoid um, a liquidity crisis? So those, those, I think, are going to be the questions for the next year. Yeah. We could take uh, the same question from Isabel, just kind of briefly connected to the, to the borderland context. Um, sure. I mean, Isabel, talked about the kind of these centrifugal powers. And I was I was thinking as 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 we were talking, the, the pattern that we've all been describing, right? The pattern of, of extreme regional inequality, um, of economic marginalization in the borderlands, the pattern of, of a state um, that uh, has made border regions dependent on an illegal and what has what it has been described, what it is itself describing as an illegal form of activities, um, what you describe as the culture of no alternative, um, as as you know a state um, compliance in a borderland with these activities, um, the the dance, whatever you call it, and the risk of explosion on the other side of it, right? So this is something that I feel like all of us have been talking about for years, have been writing about for years, but also that states are perfectly aware of, right? Um, and at the same time, and I think this is an interesting paradox. Um, we see states across the region running into that as a problem, right? Where we see states across the region being perfectly aware of the fact that their borderlands are dependent on that, are deeply dependent on that, that livelihoods are dependent on this, and that if this is being cracked down on, this will lead to major unrest in the borderlands, and yet it is being cracked down on systematically and across the region. You, the borderlands you're looking at is one of the few borderlands where we're not seeing it that much yet, yeah. But I mean, if you look at the Algerian Moroccan borderlands, that's been an enormous crackdown on that. There's been a heavy what securitization of that. Down on? Sorry for interrupting you, um, Max. Yeah. Is what is being cracked down on? Is it rather gasoline than drugs or human trafficking? I mean, that's the question. What is so, so the, the small types of survivalist smuggling across the borders, and especially the gasoline, we're seeing yeah, crackdown on across the region. We're seeing a lot of the drugs are still going through, partly also because these are more capitalized networks that have an easier time getting across barriers. But we see the, the gasoline trade in, in southern Tunisia has been hit brutally. Um, in in, in um, western Libya has been hit brutally. In uh, northern Morocco and uh, the Algerian border regions that, that border Morocco has been hit brutally. Uh, we're seeing unrest. I mean, there's the we see protests in in Kasserin. We're seeing protests in in uh, currently in Kamour, in 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 Saint Algeris, and and we, we we've seen an enormous destitution and rising poverty in, in in pockets in northern Morocco. Um. So on the one hand, we have a state that's aware of this. On the other hand, we have a state that is you know states across the regions that are running into this problem at full speed. And I think it begs the question of what's what's happening here is, is, is a specific model of state building in the region succumbing to its own contradictions? Are we seeing a, a tightening of the constituencies of the regimes and the borderlands are getting left out of that? Mm -hmm. um, or are we seeing a, a context where the, the weakness or, the, or the, the, um, the dangers in being informally included the dangers in being not included through development projects, but being included through the toleration of illegal activities are really coming back to haunt these regions. Um, and I think 
in that context, I thought, I thought Isabel's point earlier around culture and around identity becomes really important because as you might mentioned earlier, it has become easier for regimes in the center to other border regions, right? To paint them as unruly, as violent, as, um, as illegal, as criminal, as dangerous, as potentially in league with the terrorists. And I think the fact that it has become easier also for identity regions to paint it that way and that they are dependent on activities, dependent because it's the only alternative they have that can be cracked down on by the state, that can be treated differently than someone who owns a meat factory or, or you know, a factory near a harbor. I think it's becoming really, really crucial in this, in this reformulation of, of, of ruling structures in the region. And I, I don't think we fully understand that yet, but I'd really like us to think about it more. Um, but sorry, I'll, I'll stop with that. I also see that we have lots of questions on, on, on YouTube, so I'm, I'm gonna talk to less. Say, of course, we also have to ask what external actors, what role they play in that, in forcing the states to do that. I mean- Yeah, I mean, this, this, the entire securitization we're seeing across the region has, has a foreign dimension, right? Absolutely. So because you said there is such a paradox, the state knows it can't afford to crack down. So the state is also, I mean, arguing on the international level, we are cracking down, but we need more development funds. And then where the funds go is a different, this is not Algeria now, this is more Morocco and Tunisia. Um, yeah. And a different question. Max, may I just, what you just described, I mean, is there, what is a good example of a state that got out of this? I mean, you work on, 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 you look at so many border regions and then efforts to, to kind of manage that in a way which is not the way that you just described by aggravating the things, but by finding solutions. Is there any example you can think of? I'm sorry, Dalia, I'm taking, I just, I'm very curious. No, please go ahead. I have a Swiss example, um, but I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna go with that. Um, I mean, I think it, it draws to wider issues of, of regional inequality. I mean, there's German examples, right? There, and I think all these examples point to the difficulties. They don't necessarily point to the solutions, but they point to the difficulties. I'm gonna go with a Moroccan example, if, if not to purposefully annoy the Algerian panel. Um, but um, I think Morocco has quite consciously tried um, after the increasing fortification of the border between Morocco and Algeria to engage in development projects in the Northeast. And it has shown, I think, how difficult it is, because I think it has largely failed, despite the fact that it has tried very hard. And I think it has partly had such difficulties because creating relationships locally has been incredibly difficult to, to build structures locally, to get a dialogue going about what is needed in the borderlands, because the institutions for that dialogue have never been there. Um, and, and, you know, the local administrators and, and, and former smugglers and community leaders weren't in the type of dialogue that they needed to be in. And I think that's um, not necessarily a, a good example of how to do it, but I think it points us to a really important point, which is social structures, it's community structures, it's the dialogue between states and citizens. And these are things, if, if, if any meaningful development projects in borderland regions happen, and it will have to be meaningful development projects, the only way out of this, they need to happen in a conversation with local communities that know the local context. And I think that is often underestimated on how hard it is to do that and how much harder it becomes to do that when we see the kind of marginalization and othering of border regions that we commonly see now. So it's a bit of a cop-out answer, but I think it points to an important, important aspect. And we have You're right. and, you know, that yeah. and I think dialogue, you know, you said dialogue between communities and the leadership is needed in the border. It is needed everywhere. If I come back to uh, Isabel's uh, question about the Hirak, I think the Hirak is in a very sensitive position now in a, a very crucial time. It needs now to decide, and I hope that the, the confinement help people, you know, figure out what they want, uh, whether they want again to continue in this, uh, you know, uh, um, approach of degradation with all of them, you know, uh, leaving the leadership or do they have uh, more, you know, uh, substantial and less radical demands. But I think the dialogue is very important. And, and um, what the Hirak brought, again, is this capacity of Algerians to dialogue and to discuss between themselves. Now we need the dialogue to reach the other. Uh, the question is whether the other, meaning the leadership, is eager or no to listen 
uh, and at what condition. I mean, when you have a constitution, there is a draft of the constitution, there is, uh, you know, released and the same day um, you have journalists and activists put in jail while you say that actually you are opening the political arena and respecting more human rights, then it is, uh, you know, a bit of a, a paradox. And I do understand people when they don't trust this leadership. About the question of the IMF, and I just wrote a piece on that for the Middle East Institute. Uh, I think the first thing to, to, to keep in mind is the IMF is synonymous of trauma for Algerians. For many Algerians, IMF and the, the plan d'ajustement structurel of the 90s meant, you know, inflation, meant, you know, closing of, of uh, companies. I think 500,000 people were laid off. Uh, the middle class uh, disappeared and the, the, the poor uh, strata of uh, society went even uh, uh, more marginalized and went even poorer. So this is why I think there is, you know, this, this uh, thought about uh, not going to the IMF. But what other solution do they have? Uh, some experts, uh, economic experts, are, say, are saying that actually the exchange reserve are going to be, uh, you know, to end by the end of 2020, beginning of 2021. Uh, so what are the options that the Algerian authorities have today? I pessimistically tend to think that the only option that they have and they are probably going to use is the coercive uh, option. They have the means to do so. And I don't see any, any uh, you know, positive uh, uh, change uh, since, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, since uh, the election of uh, 2090s with uh, Abdel Majid Taboon. He promised so many things and he didn't deliver. As a matter of fact, he has the worst 100 days uh, any president, any Algerian president uh, uh, knew. And there is a pattern of escalation and violence in Algeria that started even before the COVID. Uh, so I am not very optimistic about what's next. And uh, to end on this and on the border, I think think like uh, for several years, unfortunately, the borderlands and the border communities are the ones who are going to pay a hefty price because they are going, you know, to be victims all over again of the politics of neglect. And I think we have three minutes to go. So um, I want to thank you, Isabel, Max. Uh, Isabel and I, we've been in panels before, but Max, for you, uh, it's the first time. So thank you again uh, for accepting the invitation. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you for the followers. Uh, I hope um, you enjoyed our chat. And I hope to see you soon, uh, especially, uh, you know, after COVID-19 ends uh, before the end of 2020. And I hope we will gather again and see each other in the real conference room. Thank you again. Thank you, Dalia. Thank Inshallah. you. Thank you. Inshallah. Bye. Thank you.